Shalom, blessings in the name of Jesus, Messiah of the world. Well, my goodness, we need to finish up this Smoky God book, and it is seriously so interesting right here. Let's pick up right where we left off. In They were taken to the city of Eden, and it says it is located in what seems to be a beautiful valley, yet in fact it is on the loftiest plateau of the northern continent several thousand feet higher than any portion of the surrounding country. And as beautiful as everything that he's describing is, let's remember again that they never even reached the Crystal City or Mount Olympus, Mount Maru, Mount Zion, the black magnetite mountain that all of our compasses point towards. They never even got there. And yet everything they're seeing is lush and beautiful. And we need to also remember that though they found Christian giants living up there, neither one of these men, in fact, both of them apparently went to their graves still believing in Odin and Thor, and they were never able to piece together that our God is an awesome God, right? And he reigns over the entire universe. So I don't know why they were not able to piece that together, but thank goodness, thank you, Father, we are. So let's continue. It's the most beautiful place I've ever beheld in my travels. This elevated garden, all manner of fruit, vine, trees, shrubs, and uh, trees, shrubs, and flowers grow in riotous profusion. In this garden, four rivers have their source in a mighty artesian fountain. They divide and flow in four directions. This place is called by inhabitants the navel of the earth or the beginning or the cradle of the human race. And we have to remember also, like in the last video, they never called the smoky god their god. They called it the throne of their god, which would make sense. It's up in the heavens, right? The throne of their god. All right. So the names of the rivers are, drum roll please, brrr, Euphrates, the Pison, the Gihon, and the Hidekel. So let's real quick go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 10 uh, through 14. And a river went out of Eden to water Alpha and Omega Divine, the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pijon, check. That is it which compasses the whole land of Shavila, where, where there is gold. And what do we learn? That this whole land is, everything is encased in gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedelium and the Onyx Stone. And the name of the second river is Gishon. Cha-ching! Got that one? The same it is that compasses Alpha and Omega, Divine, the whole land of Kush. And the name of the third river is... Hikadel, Hidikel, that's right. It's the same in the Bible as it is in this book. That is it which goes toward the east of Ashur. And the fourth river in the Bible is Perath. And, um, that's wild because they call it the Euphrates. And we also have a Euphrates river. And Yahuwah Elohim took Alpha and Omega, the man, and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to guard it. And so forth. And let's continue here. So we have several matches for scripture and names out of scripture here. And the fact that they are worshiping Jehovah. All clues. <laughs> The unexpected awaited us in this palace of beauty in the finding of our little fishing craft. It had been brought before the high priest in perfect shape, just as it had been taken from the waters that day when it was loaded on board the ship by the people who discovered us on the river more than a year before. We were given an audience of over two hours with this great dignitary, that is, the great high priest. It's also another Bible term, the great high priest, who seemed kind, like it sounds like Melchizedek, right? Who seemed kindly disposed and considerate. He was a good man. He showed himself eagerly interested, asking us numerous questions, 
and invariably regarding things about which his emissaries had failed to inquire. So he was wiser than all the rest. And it also says he was taller. And at the conclusion of the interview, he inquired our pleasure, asking us whether we wished to remain in his upper country or if we preferred to return to the lower world, providing it were possible to make a successful return trip across the frozen belt barrier that encircles the earth. <sighs> Hallelujah, thank you, Father. Hallelujah! My father replied, It would please me and my son to visit your country and to see your people, your colleges and palaces of music and art, your great fields, your wonderful forests of timber, and after we have done and have this pleasurable privilege, we should like to try to return to our home. This son is my only child, and my good wife will be weary awaiting our return. Now here, the great high priest prophesies, and he warns him, listen, he says it right out, the first thing out of his mouth, he says, I fear you can never return replied the chief high priest, because the way is a most hazarded one, hazardous one. However, you shall visit the different countries with Jules Galdea, his giant uh, host, as your escort, and be accorded every courtesy and kindness. Whenever you are ready to attempt a return voyage, voyage I assure you that your boat, which is here on exhibition, shall be put in the waters of the river Hedekel at its mouth, and we will bid you Jehovah Speed. Jehovah Speed. Thus terminated our only interview with the high priest or ruler of the continent. And I want to uh, reiterate that um, across frozen barriers and a belt that surrounds the earth, never ever did they go underground or witness any kind of caverns, caves, or anything suggesting inner earth. They never climbed down into anything. He, all he says is they sailed north, sailed north, sailed, sailed north. All right, let's continue. Josephus says, God prolonged the life of the patriarchs that preceded the deluge, both on account of their virtues and to give them the opportunity of perfecting the sciences of geometry and astronomy which they had discovered. Hallelujah. Okay, so um, let's continue here. The people are exceedingly... No, 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 back up. In our travels, we came to a forest of gigantic trees. Close your eyes and use your most vivid childhood imagination right now. Just let God fill your mind with the pictures of Eden. We came to a forest of gigantic trees near the city of Delphi. Had the Bible said there were trees towering over 300 feet in height and more than 30 feet in diameter growing in the Garden of Eden, the Ingersolls, the Tom Paines, and the Voltaires would doubtless have pronounced the statement a myth. Yet this is the description of California Sequoia Gigantia. But these California giants pale into insignificance when compared with the forest Goliath found in the upper northern region continent where abound mighty trees from 800 to 1,000 feet in height and from 100 to 120 feet in diameter, countless in numbers, forming forests extending hundreds of miles back from the sea. The people are exceedingly musical and learn to, learned to a remarkable degree in their arts, in their sciences, especially geometry and astronomy. Their cities are equipped with vast palaces of music, where not infrequently as many as 25,000 lusty voices of this giant race swell forth in a mighty chorus of the most sublime symphonies. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The children are not supposed to attend institutions of learning before they're 20. Their school life begins and continues for 30 years, 10 of which are uniformly devoted by both sexes to the study of 
music. And what was the first thing to go when they started dumbing us down in school? Music, right? We need to know mu everything was created with a song. Hallelujah. Their principal vocations are architecture, agriculture, horticulture, the raising of vast herds of cattle, building of conveyances peculiar to that country for travel on land and water by some device which I cannot explain. They hold communion with one another between the most distant parts of their country on air currents. No device needed. All buildings are erected with special regard to strength, durability, beauty, and symmetry, and with a style of architecture vastly more attractive to the eye than any I have ever observed elsewhere. About three-fourths of the uh, upper northern region of the earth is land, and about one-fourth of it is water. There are numerous rivers of tremendous size, some flowing in a northerly direction, others southerly. Some of these rivers are 30 miles in width, and it is out of these vast waterways at the extreme north and southern uh, in regions where low temperatures are experienced that fresh water icebergs are formed. They are then pushed out to sea like huge tongues of ice by the abnormal freshets of turbulent waters that twice every year sweep everything before them. We saw innumerable specimens of bird life no larger than those encountered in the forests of Europe or America. It is well known that during the last few years whole species of birth have, birds have quit the earth. A writer in a recent article on this subject says, Is it not possible that these disappearing bird species quit their habitation without and find an asylum in the far north? Hallelujah! Whether inland among the mountains or along the seashore, we found bird life prolific. When they spread their great wings, some of the birds appeared to measure 30 feet from tip to tip. They are of great variety and many colors. We were permitted to climb up on the edge of a rock and examine a nest of eggs. There were five in the nest, each of which was at least two feet in length and 15 inches in diameter. After we had been in the city of Hectea about a week, Professor Galdea uh, took us to an inlet where we saw thousands of, of tortoises along the sandy shore. I hesitate to state the size of these great turtle creatures. They were from 25 to 30 feet in length, from 15 to 20 feet in width, and fully 7 feet in height. When one of them projected its head, it had the appearance of some hideous sea monster. The strange conditions up north are favorable not only for vast meadows of luxuriant grasses, forests of giant trees, and all manner of vegetable life, but wonderful mammal life as well. And one day we saw a great herd of elephants. There must have been 500 of these thunder-throated monsters. With their restlessly waving trunks, they were tearing huge bows from the trees and trampling smaller undergrowth like dust into so much hazelbrush. They would average about over a hundred feet in length and from 75 to 85 feet in height. There's a, also there's a hazy mist that goes up from the land each morning. And invariably, it rains once every 24 hours. That's what happens when you have the Shekinah of Yahuwah on you. It rains every single day. Hallelujah! This great moisture and invigorating electrical light and warmth account perhaps for the luxuriant vegetation, while the highly charged electrical air and the evenness of climatic conditions may, climatic conditions may have much to do with the giant growth and longevity of all animal life. In places, the level valley stretched away for many miles in every direction. The smoky god throne, in its clear white light, in its clear white light, no sun simulator, the smoky god in its clear white light looked calmly down. There was an intoxication in the electrically surcharged air that fanned the cheek as softly as a vanishing whisper. 
Nature chanted a lullaby in the faint murmur of winds, whose breath was sweet with the fragrance of bud and blossom. After having spent considerably more than a year in visiting several of the many cities of the upper northern region and a great deal of intervening country, and more than two years had passed from the time we had been picked up by the great excursion ship on the river called Naz, N-A-Z, and now we decided to cast our fortunes once more upon the sea and endeavor to go home. We made known our wishes, and they were reluctantly but promptly followed. Our host gave my father, at his request, various maps showing the entire upper surface of the earth, its cities, oceans, seas, rivers, gulfs, and bays. They also generously offered to give us all the bags of gold nuggets, some of them as large as a goose's egg, that we were willing to attempt to take with us in our little fishing boat. Hallelujah. In due time, we returned to Jehu. Now, I looked up Jehu again, and it actually means, uh, let's see here. It's right here. Jehu that has several meanings. Jehu itself means he shall be. Jehubab means he was hidden, and Jehu Kao means Jehovah will prevail. So no matter, and then Jehud means he will be praised. Jehudai means patronomic proceeding written also Jew. Jehuja means Jah will be praised, also written Jewess. Jehua, he will secure, he will assemble or hasten. Right? Hallelujah. The Lord is coming soon. Let me get you up off that blanket. There we go. Okay, in due time we, re we return to Jehu, the city at which we spent one month in fixing up and overhauling our little sloop. After all was in readiness, the same ship called Naz, which comes from the word Nazarene and Nazareth, it means to be separated, to be set apart, hallelujah. It also means uh, to be related to, of the same gentility, like a branch of the same tree. That originally discovered us, this ship Naz, took us on board and, na and sailed to the mouth of the river Hedekal. After our giant brothers had launched our little craft for us, they were most cordially regretful at parting and evinced much solicitude for our safety. Our, my father swore by the gods Odin and Thor that he would surely return again within a year or two and pay them another visit. I'm sure they just shook their heads in sorrow, knowing they would never return. And thus we bade them adieu. We made ready and hoisted our sail. I'm sure in that la last two and a half years that they had been witness to about Jehovah, had they had probably been to all their worship services, they said themselves they had listened to 25,000 lusty voices praising Jehovah, and yet they were still unconverted. So it was, I'm sure, sad, even though they didn't, ever talk about Jesus, of course, they wouldn't need Jesus there. There's nobody there to save. Jesus is the all. He's part of the, the Godhead, the, the Elohim, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So he is that smoky God. And this is what we know from all the scripture we've read from the Bible to the Dead Sea Scrolls to, to even finding stories like this that just happened in the last hundred or so years. Okay, we were becalmed within an hour after our giant friends had left us and started on their return trip. The winds were constantly blowing south. That is, they were blowing from northern uh, part of the earth towards that which we knew to be the south. Okay. There was a mild, luminous light which was still with us, which my father said resulted from the sun shining in. Uh, you know, that they could still see the smoky God. And that night we slept soundly and awakened the next morning as refreshed as if we had been in our own beds at Stockholm. At breakfast we started out on an island, inland tour of discovery, but had not gone far when we sighted some birds, which we recognized at once as belonging to the penguin family.
you see it? They are flightless birds, but excellent swimmers and tremendous in size, with white breasts, short wings, black head, and long beaked tails, long peaked bills. They stand fully 90 feet tall. They looked at us with a little surprise, and presently waddled rather than walked towards the water, and swam away in a northerly direction. The events that occurred during the following hundred or more days beg description. We were on an open and iceless sea. The month we reckon to be December, which we know on God's holy calendar as a tenth holy month, part of the four divisions of the year in regards and remembrance of Noah. And we knew the so-called South Pole was turned towards the sun. Okay, they're still thinking that they're on a ball. Therefore, when passing out and away from the internal electric light of the smoky God and its genial warmth, we thought we would be met by the light and the warmth of the sun, the yellow sun. And he says, we were not mistaken. Let's finish this up. There were times when our little craft, driven by the wind that was continuous and persistent, shot through the waters like an arrow. Indeed, had we had encountered a hidden rock or obstacle, our little vessel would have been crushed into kindling wood. At last we were conscious that the atmosphere was growing decidedly colder. And a few days later, icebergs were sighted far to the left. My father argued, and correctly, that the winds which filled our sails came from the warm climate from the upper northern region. Hallelujah. The time of the year was most certainly most auspicious for us to make our dash for the lower world and attempt to scud our fishing sloop through open channels of the frozen zone which surrounds the polar regions. We were soon amid the ice packs and how our little craft got through the narrow channels and escaped being crushed, I know not. The nights are never so dark at the pole as in other regions, for the moon and stars seem to possess twice as much light and effulgence. In addition, there is a continuous light, the very shades of play of which are amongst the strangest phenomenon of nature, and that's from Rembrandt's astronomy. And from Humboldt we read the fact that gives the phenomenon of the polar aurora its greatest importance is the earth is that the earth itself becomes self luminous and it shows its capability of sustaining a luminous process proper to itself. Hallelujah. And I wanted to read you just a little bit more regarding the smoky planet out of the, the Colburn Bible, which is like a Celtic history book and um, has histories from all over the world. And we right now we're in the Book of e Origins. And uh, it's chapter 3. And it's regarding the flood tale. Okay. In the wild land, cultivators who give, gave the flood tale to our house-building forebears, but the generation of its happening is lost. In those days, men were inclined to the ways of peace, and harvest followed winter without change. But it came about that looking up into the darkling night sky, they saw a strangely formed moon chariot overhead. It passed away into the rosy dawning of a newborn day, but then at the night end of the sky roof appeared the dread figure of Awemkored, that's what they call Planet X, Revealing itself to the eyes of wandering men, it crawled out into the brightness. The foul breath of the nightcomer newly sprung from the dark depths of its unearthly lair, spread across the brightening face of heaven like an evil gray veil. And even the ever-fearless sun withdrew to guard himself in red war armor. The fast-beating hearts of men first shriveled with despair at the fearsome sight, 
then rose while their throats responded with glad cries as the moon chariot came back over the dim horizon. There was an awful hell echoing clash with the noise of ten thousand rolling thunders and men bold enough to look were stricken with blindness and uncovered ears were deafened forever. The hellish uh, planet X, he calls it Awamkara, drooled white cinders, which if they touched the skin of men below raised evil wheels. The unearthly foemen, the evil angels, fell apart and hurled great self-created rocks at each other in the heavens. Onlookers below dashed for protective shelters. They howled down out of the sky above. The very earth herself immovable was sickened with fear. Her bowels became loosed with dread and belly trembled before the awful sight. It's talking about earthquakes. Men looking anxiously to their Lord, which they, at that time was the sun, were dismayed to see his constant change of war garb from red to blue, from red to yellow, then to green, then to brown. Good Mother Earth opened her ground mouth and roared ear-cracking protests while her whole comforting body shook in fear under the gloomy battle shadow form above in the heavens. Men and beasts were drawn together in strange brotherhood of fear. This is the tale of the sky fight. But whether it happened before or after the generation of the flood tale, none now truly knows. It concerns the doom dragon, what we call Planet X, right? What has come more than once and will come again. And the last music mankind will hear is the shrill, throbbing notes of the doom song. And what are we waiting for? But the trumpets to start blaring, right? In Revelation. Hallelujah. Okay, let's jump over. Now we're still in the Colburn Bible. We're in the book of the Britain book, uh, chapter 3. Um, and it's talking about Jesus. Hallelujah. Verse 44. For the kingdom of heaven is neither here nor there and contains all good things. It is in the hearts of men uh, and exists where God reigns. When the lion lies down with the lamb and peace reigns over all, there shall be found the kingdom of heaven. I told you that was a uh, Mandela effect. That I always knew that, that verse was a lion laying down with a lamb. God, I remember memorizing it when I was a child, and I, you know, that's not something you forget. We even had a poster in our Sunday school class with the lion laying down with the lamb. <laughs> All right, it's not a verse you can forget. Hallelujah! When the lion lies down with the lamb, and peace reigns over all, there shall be found. The kingdom of heaven. I mean, that's talking about when the new Jerusalem comes down. Yet truly, heaven and the kingdom of heaven are not the same. These things were said in the forecourt of the temple. And it's fixing to cut me off again. So I wanted to round off with that. And let's try to get a prayer out before it cuts me off. Let me, Abba Father, how holy... Abba Father, creator of the universe, creator of us all, lover of mankind, let me embrace your spirit and full knowledge of my twofold nature. Guide my feet towards the great law. Keep me on the narrow path by which all true seekers find the light. As long as my body and spirit remain together, so long will I preach to men and sing your praises, seeking always to awaken a response in their hearts. Bless me with the sweetness of speech and harmony of voice. Help keep me from the grip of greed and from the loud mouth futilities and frivolities of illiterate men. Spare me the sad companionship of the sanctimonious ones. In silence, hands uplifted, heart humbled and mind stilled, your servant presumes to come into your presence. O oh, great understanding one, father of us all, Grant me the abounding joy of union with your spirit. Grant that all my deeds be in harmony with the great eternal law that is the Torah and that I may learn to acquire wisdom so I may illuminate the hearts of 
Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and keep you. You may he send angels to guide, guard, and protect you, and the Holy Spirit to pour out over you as you read his word, that you would understand every letter. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. All glory to the Most High. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.